this digest and e-blast. Well, we're fortunate today to have Ryan Cruz. Um, Ryan uh, is one of the hosts uh, at uh, Iowa with Madeira, and Ryan has um, done a great job uh, help coordinating this and eventually take this over. Um, he is uh, he did his fellowship with Madeiric, so his ultrasound skills are quite advanced. Um, and we were just talking, he does a lot of uh, plantar fascia 10Xs. So therefore uh, his diagnostic ultrasound for the um, plantar hind foot um, uh, is advanced. And so he's gonna present a case today called plantar hind foot pain. So Ryan, take it away. All right, thanks, Doug. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Are we good here? We are. Okay. Um, all right. So good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for the intro, Doug. Um, so like Doug was saying, you know, the, the case today is, is, is a patient with a painful plantar heel, which everybody who's on this talk right now probably has, has had this patient in their office uh, more times than, um, than you can count. So we will, we will just get rolling here if my slides want to work. All right. So notice closures. I don't. I don't often um, do this, but I think it's 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 relevant here. So just a quick quick thanks. So Maderick um, has been stuck being a mentor of mine since he was stuck with me as a fellow, and then obviously these guys on the right. So Jason, the Jake Sellen, and, and John Finoff have really been instrumental in my um, ultrasound education. So so I'd be remiss to not um, not mention all these guys. So the, the objectives here, you know, the, the, the whole goal of, of this series is really to kind of teach and show how we go about evaluating, you know, somebody who comes in with, you know, a specific complaint. So, so for me, so for plantar hind foot pain, I, I think, you know, it's important to not, you know, just focus specifically on the three things that are on the plantar heel and really think about the patient and how you would sonographically evaluate that patient, you know, in order to, to obtain an accurate diagnosis. Um, so we'll kind of go through at least my protocol um, on what I do for most folks that will come in um, with, with plantar heel pain. We'll talk about uh, some examples of, of, of certain findings that we will commonly see, you know, uh, particularly pertaining to this specific patient. And I think the other important part here, and, and folks that have presented previously have, have, have mentioned this as well, you know, I think a lot of us can, you know, find a specific structure, snap a few pictures, and, and that's it. But I think being able um, to find the, the structures, to, to take adequate images, and then be able to portray that information in a, um, in a diagnostic report is is a tough skill to to master, and, I, and so I think there there there's value and importance in really going over um, how we how we write these reports. And I will sort of like Doug did previously in his talk, I'll break down the my diagnostic report per structure um, as we go through this. Then I'll show you the full report uh, at the end, and and maybe mention briefly my thought process on on why I do things this way. So we will get rolling here. So this patient, um, I saw her, oh, I think eight, nine months ago, but she's a 34 year old lady, you know, again, typical story, a traumatic heel pain, you just kind of one day woke up and things didn't feel that great. Um, no trauma that she can, she can recall all of her symptoms really localized to uh, kind of plantar medial heel. But as with most of these patients, you know, it can radiate down to the arch. Um, there may or may not be, you know, some some buzzing or tingling associated on the uh, on the plantar foot. And then again, she wakes up in the morning, she steps down, bad deal, you know, very symptomatic. Then she'll walk a bit more, and and and, and symptoms improve. But then by the end of the day, things are are uh, are quite uncomfortable for her. Her examination pretty pretty straightforward. She's tender along the uh, medial plantar heel a bit to the um, medial, or I'm sorry, plantar uh, midfoot as well. Passive toe extension somewhat reproduces her symptoms and then really, um, really no tunnels over her medial ankle, uh, specifically in the tarsal tunnel. So these are her x-rays, her uh, foot x-rays. So nothing, um, 
uh, all that extraordinary here. You can see a little calcaneal and pizza fight here. Uh, maybe there's an Achilles and pizza fight, a little haglins, but otherwise everything else um, looks relatively okay. So my, my general scanning protocol here um, is, is, is sometimes a bit robust, but I think there's, there's a reason for it. There's a lot of mimickers of plantar fascia or fasciitis, right? So I will, I'll always start with the basics, you know, plantar fascia origin, fat pad, and calcaneus. And those are my, you know, hard and fast images that I will obtain every single time. Um, we do know that some of these <clears throat> nerve entrapment syndromes can often mimic um, plantar fasciitis and plantar heel pain. So I will look at, at the uh, medial ankle, oftentimes um, looking at the tibial nerve specifically, as well as its, its corresponding uh, distal branches to, number one, look for any abnormalities and oftentimes you know, being able or being able to um, elicit reproduction of symptoms with sonal palpation, I have found has been really helpful for me. Um, so I'll do that. Uh, depending on the patient, I'll typically pop over quickly to the posterior hind foot, specifically the Achilles, uh, because again, you know, I've I've been fooled a couple times where somebody for all the world sounds like they've got plantar fasciitis and their plantar fascia looks stone cold normal on ultrasound. And then we look at their Achilles insertion um, and they've got, you know, a rip roar and tendinosis or, or even like a, like a retro calc uh, bursitis. So I started incorporating that um, on patients as well. And then I think there's a couple other things, uh, other uh, structures that you can look at as, as indicated, you know, I will <clears throat> typically look at the, at the lateral cord insertion on the base of the fifth um, in a fair number of patients. And then, you know, certainly if you're concerned for one of these uh, tibial nerve entrapment uh, syndromes, looking at foot intrinsic musculature for, you know, atrophy or, or fatty changes can be, um, can be helpful. But admittedly, I don't, I do not do that in, uh, in every patient. So quickly, uh, <clears throat> plantar fascia anatomy, you know, I think oftentimes we throw around you know, interchangeable names for uh, for these different portions of the plantar fascia. And I think it's important to really understand, you know, what we're talking about here. So the majority of, of, of uh, plantar fascia changes are going to involve this central cord, <clears throat> which is this uh, green structure that we can see here. Everybody knows this, you know, originating, originating from this medial calcaneal tubercle and, and extending distally. You know, when we talk about the uh, medial band that is not interchangeable with the central cord. So this is very different structure. It courses medially um, just off the calcaneus and essentially covers the adductor hallucis muscle um, as it extends, like I said, medially. And then the lateral cord out here, you know, the vast majority of, of this structure is going to originate, I'm sorry, insert on the base of the fifth. Some folks will have some distal extension into the, um, the distal foot here, but the insertion on the base of the fifth is um, is a common site of pathology. So just a, a bit of nomenclature there, but I think is important when we're, you know, writing these reports and and communicating with each other. So this is our patient here. So this is her uh, plantar fascia origin here. So on the top left here, I've got plantar fascia and long axis with proximal to the left, <clears throat> and distal to the right. We've got calcaneus here, and then this is all her uh, her plantar fascia here. So very thick, very edematous, very hypoechoic. You can see somewhat normalization of, of fascia um, echo texture here. This is the um, uh, corolla view in short axis. So now we've got medial to the left. This is calcaneus. All of this is very thick. Um, like I said, edematous plantar fascia. I will always measure this. I think this is helpful. So this, this patient had a measurement of about 8.5 millimeters. I typically use about four millimeters or 0.4 centimeters as my cutoff of um, of normal. So we already know that she's got some stuff going on in her in her plantar fascia, and I'll typically follow out central cord, you know, pretty far uh, into the midfoot and even maybe the proximal forefoot, um, because we do know that people like this patient here can have some uh, some distal changes in her plantar fascia. So this little focal fusiform swelling here. This is all plantar fascia with FDB muscle deep. Um, <clears throat> normal fascia proximally, normal fascia distally. So this focal enlargement um, is, a, is a fibroma. So she's, she's got a couple things going on here already, which, which may explain why she has both heel as well as, um, 
as well as uh, arch pain here. So that's my evaluation there for central cord. And so my report at this part, or I'm sorry, at this portion of the examination would be that the central cord is thickened with uh, hypochloric heterogeneity, no tear. I will comment on the thickness and then, which is like I said, 8.5 millimeters, and then also describe hypoechoic thickening approximately 1.2 centimeters distal of the calcaneus. I'll comment on the length, <clears throat> which in this patient, it didn't show up in the calipers here, which is 2.6 centimeters. I will measure the fibroma thickness just for completeness sake. Um, and that will be my, uh, my description of the central cord here. Just quickly, a couple of correlative examples here. <clears throat> so at the insertion, we can see you know, in this patient, this little intrasubstance tear as denoted by the uh, yellow arrow here. So both in long and short axis here. And some folks will see some calcific changes at the origin, um, which I think can often be quite, uh, quite uncomfortable. <clears throat> and then plantar fascia rupture here. You basically see, you know, complete loss of tension between these two ends of the plantar fascia with really, you know, no, um, no normal fibers uh, spanning the gap here. So this is not our patient again, just a couple correlative examples. So then moving on to the lateral cord. So again, we've got proximal to the left, distal to the right. Here's the her lateral cord plantar fascia. So it looks it looks fine. So it's got you know normal hyperechoic uh, appearance. It's well organized. It's not edematous. Here it is in short axis. It's the structure right here. Um, and then again, I'll often follow these out to the uh, base of the fifth insertion. There's a bit of nuance here um, with the lateral cord and then uh, fibularis brevis tendon inserting out here. But uh, as long as you follow this out um, from a proximal location, you can find its insertion on the on the base of the fifth there. So for this, um, I would say that lateral cord is normal in appearance, no tear. Um, <clears throat> I'll measure this, you know, maximal thickness at uh, 0.25. Um, 0.25 centimeters, so uh, rather quick um, uh, report there. And again, just another correlative example here, primarily distally. So this is a prior patient that had pretty robust uh, uh, distal lateral cord uh, fasciopathy right at the base of the fifth here. So something to always keep in mind. I know this is a plantar hind foot case, but you know, really follow these structures out because sometimes you can be surprised at, uh, at what you see here. Um, just to comment on this, so the, the medial band of the plantar fascia, I, I personally have not seen any pathology in this region. Um, <clears throat> maybe it's seen me, but I have not seen it. But, you know, it's, it's this kind of fibrous tissue that, like I said, will branch out medially and cover the um, abductor hallucis. And you can see in this uh, cine loop here, you can see this hyperechoic structure that is, like I said, kind of uh, fanning out medially here and coursing over that muscle that I mentioned. So that would be the, um, the medial band here. And to be honest, I don't often um, comment on this and because again, I haven't really seen much pathology here, but just for completeness sake, you know, that's what it would look like. And, and this patient, the, um, uh, the medial band is normal. From there, I'll move on to plantar fat pad. <clears throat> and as everybody knows, you know, plantar fat pad is a shock absorbing tissue in, in the heel. It's like a like the cushioning within a, you know, a good pair of, of running shoes um, composed of, of both these, um, these macro and micro chambers, again, that, that are primarily there to absorb shock <clears throat> and prevent that shock from being transmitted deeply uh, into plantar fascia and, and calcaneus here. So certainly, you know, pathology to be seen in this region. In this patient, this is for plantar fat pad, or I'm sorry, this is not our patient. This is a correlative example. Um, I, for whatever reason, couldn't get my images from this specific patient. But for fat pad, you know, we'll look for loss of this kind of normal homogenous uh, echo texture here. So if it becomes hypoechoic and edematous. Um, you can see, uh, you can see fat fracture. I'll show an example here in a second. And then oftentimes, or every time I'll measure this. So I'll measure an uncompressed heel pad here, which measures 1.37 and the maximally compressed, which measures 1.17. We'll calculate a heel compressibility or a fat pad compressibility index. Um, and then I'll also grab a cine loop. And you know, usually I'll eyeball this and I'm looking for around 50% compression um, with sono palpation. And then if, you know, if there's you know, a screaming abnormality there, we'll take measurements. Um, 
but in this patient, her compressibility index was normal. Uh, this is from a Derek's paper a couple of years ago, just showing what we can see in the plantar fat pads. So this uh, hypochoic region um, demonstrates these edematous changes. And then uh, oftentimes traumatic, but not always, you can see these little hypochoic clefts within the uh, fat pad, which would be representative of a fat fracture. Um, plantar fat pad abnormalities are, are quite a challenge um, from a treatment perspective. So I always know that if I see something like this, along with my plantar fascia problem in a patient, that we're going to have a, a little bit of a, of a challenge potentially um, from a treatment perspective. Calcaneus, quickly, you know, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at this as I'm looking at plantar fascia. You know, clearly you're not going to do a full bony evaluation. That's not where ultrasound is useful here, but we, we can catch some pathology here. Um, so in, in this patient, long story short, this is her calcaneus, this hyperechoic linear structure here, nothing abnormal here. And so really, you know, I'm not doing a full calcaneus evaluation. I'll look at the level of plantar fascia, maybe a bit medial here. And then if, if I see something abnormal, I'll comment on it. But more often than not, you know, I'll just say that the evaluated region of calcaneus is, um, is normal here. So this is from a paper a couple of years ago, two years ago. So some things that we can see, and what I've seen a couple of times is a calcaneal stress fracture or a stress reaction, I should say. And I've seen this, you know, primarily in somebody who has a pretty crummy fat pad, because again, the, uh, those forces are not being absorbed by that fat pad and they're getting transmitted deep to the calcaneus. So we can pick up stress injuries here. You know, in this patient, you see this periosteal edema as noted by this hypoechoic um, uh, region, uh, superficial to the calcaneus, <clears throat> and then this lights up with, uh, with Doppler. So that would be concerning for a, a stress injury. This is a patient a couple of years ago of mine who had vague you know, plantar medial heel pain, um, high level athlete who we were scanning, we we're taking a look at bifurcate ligament, and then we saw this little cortical disruption at the anterior process calcaneus. So this patient had a, um, had a fracture there. So, Again, while not common, you know, I think there's there is some role in at least commenting on <clears throat> on the bony structure, specifically calcaneus, when you're doing these scans. Next, I'll move uh, to the to the medial ankle, specifically looking at the tibial nerve and its corresponding branches. You know, I'll certainly take a quick peek at uh, you know the, the 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 tendons in the tarsal tunnel at the medial ankle, um, but I don't often do full evaluations of those tendons. Um, my, my primary concern here is the tibial nerve, which we can see is this honeycomb appearance um, in the middle of this uh, picture here. <clears throat> so this is, um, I stole this picture from uh, Dr. Smith's paper seven years ago because the, the anatomic dissection here is, is, is fantastic. So we can see tibial nerve here and then the, the branch points into the you know, three corresponding distal branches. Now, primarily, you know, we'll see medial calcaneal branch come off first, posteriorly, followed by, uh, you know, a, a division of the tibial nerve into medial lateral plantar. But what I've learned as I'm scanning more and more of these is that that is not always the case. And there's quite a bit of anatomic variation. So really tracing these nerves distally to see where they go. And then coming back up proximally will we'll, uh, let you identify and confirm which nerve um, you're, you're specifically uh, looking at during that scan. This is our patient here. So I've got, I've got posterior to the left, proximal, I'm sorry, anterior to the right here. Here's her medial plantar, lateral plantar, and medial calcaneal nerves, all of which in this region um, uh, look okay. Next, I'll, I'll really target two of these uh, nerves and follow them distally. And you know, there are specific entrapment points um, that can cause uh, uh, cause plantar heel and foot pain. So one of the most common ones is, is this Baxter's nerve, the first branch lateral plantar nerve here. Again, this image uh, with this um, with the with the bottom image here, I stole from Dr. Smith's paper. But so first branch lateral plantar nerve is a mimicker of of uh, plantar heel pain, plantar fasciitis, and Typically, I'll follow it down distally until I see it at this interval, which is the interval between adductor hallucis and quadratus plantae, or plantae, excuse me, um, <clears throat> looking for focal compression in this area. And also, if there's very specific focal uh, pain with sonal palpation here, I think that can be helpful 
um, <clears throat> looking at, at at this as the culprit for uh, the patient's plantar heel pain. Um, but in this patient, her her uh, first branch lateral plantar nerve was normal, and um, and she had no pain with sonal palpation over this region. Next, I will uh, I will follow a medial plantar nerve distally, <clears throat> which of course is right over this intersection between FDL and FHL, which is another site of of entrapment. Um, yeah, admittedly, this is a bit more distal than somebody who has. Um, you know, plant or truly plantar heel pain more proximally, but still for completeness sake, I will follow this out um, and trace it. So we can see here um, this structure, this honeycomb hyperechoic structure here is a medial plantar nerve. This is navicular up here. And we've all heard of the, uh, the master knot of Henry. So where FDL and FD, FHL course near each other, FDL on, on top of uh, FHL, and this can be a, a site of entrapment of the medial plantar nerve. So I will scan this as well. I think my sending loop stopped. <clears throat> but you can see here, medial plantar nerve is here, and here is FDL and FHL deep. Um, so again, I'll look for any focal entrapment in that region. And again, I rely heavily on, on pain with sonopalpation. I think you know that's a trick that can be really, really helpful, especially for some of these small nerves, which you know, it can be sometimes challenging to see, you know, vesicular loss in a nerve where you really can only see a couple of fascicles. So I, I rely um, on pain with sonopalpation uh, quite often in, the, in these folks. And then once I go through, like I said, tibial nerve proper at the tarsal tunnel, as well as the distal branches, primarily um, first branch lateral plantar nerve and medial plantar nerve, then I'll comment on, on all of those structures. So for this patient, tibial nerve in the tarsal tunnel is normal uh, without focal compression or fascicular loss. And then again, medial uh, calcaneal, medial plantar, and lateral plantar are all, um, are all normal in appearance. So uh, foot intrinsic musculature, you know, I'll, I'll kind of uh, fly through this um, when I'm doing the scan, unless I'm really concerned about, like I said, a focal nerve entrapment. <clears throat> so this is our patient here, plantar fascia up top with FDB muscle belly deep to it. You, know, you can see the, the, the normal aquitecture of the FDB muscle here, which looks stone cold normal. This is from Doug's paper uh, uh, back in 2014, which shows this kind of uh, uh, muscle atrophy or fatty infiltration of the ADM muscle here. And I think, you know, deciding which muscles to, to investigate really depends on which nerve you're concerned about. You know, so we know medial plantar nerve is going to innervate adductor halysis, FDB, FHB, and, and the first lumbricle, um, and all other intrinsic muscles are supplied by the lateral plantar nerve. So you can pick your muscle accordingly. And I, I don't know if it's helpful or not, but I often think about the lateral plantar nerve um, as analogous to the ulnar nerve in the hand in terms of, um, of, of muscles that it uh, specifically innervates. So with this patient, I guess I didn't comment on it, but her, um, her foot musculature was uh, normal in appearance. And then again, I'll oftentimes just to complete the examination, flip around to the posterior hind foot just for a quick evaluation of the, of the Achilles tendon. So we can see on this right image here, this is uh, Achilles tendon in long axis with with, uh, uh, with proximal to the I'm sorry with the uh, calcaneus on the on the right proximal to the left here. Uh, so that all looks looks normal there. We can see Achilles mid substance here on the left, and then the uh, correlative view in short axis down the bottom here with that normal hyperechoic you know uh, fibrillar broom end appearance of the Achilles tendon here. So that all. That all looks great. Um, and then finally, you know, we'll comment on any retrocalcaneal bursa or retro Achilles bursal pathology, um, uh, fluid and, and, and whatnot here. So for this patient, you know, Achilles tendon is intact and I'll comment both on the mid substance and the insertion, both of which are normal in appearance and then no fluid within, the, uh, within either, either bursa. We're almost, almost finishing up here. So, the <clears throat> this is a, a, a general template of my ultrasound report um and i think you know anybody who's watched a couple of these lectures a lot of us do this a little bit differently uh, and i don't think there's a wrong answer at all as long as you're comfortable with you know how you convey your information as long as you're consistent so for me 
And this is pretty standard, you know, whoever refers the patient, where we did it, it's what we're looking at, um, what type of exam, the machine that we used it on, the frequency, I'll typically use a 14 megahertz uh, linear <clears throat> for my plantar heel scans um, or plantar hind foot scans, you know, what side we're looking at, if there was any uh, prior imaging, and then my findings. So I've already gone over this. I'm not going to reread all of this, but um, Kintaro mentioned this, I think it was last week, you know, for me and my findings, I will more often than not, sometimes I get lazy, but more often than not, I will just describe, <clears throat> and I've gotten better at this. I used to cheat um, and, and be quite lazy, but I've started and, and, and become better at really just describing what I see in the findings um, and, and not making calls in, in the findings. And then in the summary, you know, if we're talking about focal, you know, hypoechoic heterogeneity in the findings, you know, what the heck does that mean in the summary? So for me, that's plantar fasciosis. So my summary is, is really um, kind of giving a specific uh, diagnosis to what I am describing in the, in the findings. Um, and I think that is, is helpful because a lot of, you know, referring providers they don't want to read any of this up here. They don't really care if there's, you know, if, if it's hypoechoic or, or hyperechoic or if it's edematous or whatever. They just want to know what it is and what the deal is. So the, I think the summary is helpful for them to be able just to skip all of this and just see, you know, what the heck is going on. So in this patient, um, after going through all the findings, there's clearly uh, plantar fasciopathy, you know, with this uh, plantar fascia fibroma um, as described above. And then you know, since there is some overlap with, like I said, some of these tibial nerve um, abnormalities, I will comment <clears throat> that there's no evidence of any tibial nerve um, tibial nerve pathology. But I think, you know, bottom line here, just being able to really convey what you see um, <clears throat> on ultrasound is is initially challenging, especially coming out of fellowship. That was one of the hardest things for me was, you know, I, you know, I learned how to take a picture of the plantar fascia and, and of the calcaneus and, and so on and so forth. But then trying to explain that to somebody else in a report, I, I think takes a lot of practice and, um, but is a, is a, is a critical part of, of all of this. So that is what I have. So I think we might have a, a minute or two uh, for questions. So thanks everybody. Ryan, that was great. Um, that was comprehensive, but also <clears throat> practical. Uh, one question for you. Um, you know, one of the challenges I have sometimes is distinguishing between a, what I call a mid-substance plantar fasci fasciopathy, meaning, you know, thickening, you know, that you showed versus a fibroma. Do you have tricks um, uh, on helping to distinguish between the two? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think for me, I, I'll, I'll primarily look at plantar fascia at the calcaneus first. And what I've seen personally, you know, in, in somebody who has both, and this is not the case all the time, but, you know, you'll see focal thickening at the calcaneus. And then more often than not, you all see somewhat normalization of that, you know, fascial thickness and fascial echo texture. And then again, kind of focal ballooning distally. And, you know, if, if I, if I don't see any sort of pathologic changes, you know, right at the calcaneal origin, um, and it's, you know, a, a millimeter or more off the calcaneus, you know, I think I'm more, I'm more inclined to call that a fibroma versus, you know, true central cord plantar fasciopathy or fasciosis. Um, you know, I, I think it's a bit of nuance, um, at least in my practice, you know, I'm probably going to treat them somewhat the same, but um, yeah, I, I think just for me, it's, it's, it's the presence or absence of, of focal pathologic um, changes specifically at the calcaneal origin is going to make me kind of lean one way or the other as to whether or not I'm calling this, you know, fasciosis versus a, uh, versus a fibroma. Yeah, it's, it's this, hard. This... You know, I, I've learned over time that um, fibromas that are not full thickness, you know, they tend to uh, form on the superficial portion of the central cord um, and spare the deep portion. And you can still see some of that fibular echo texture, you know, through the deep cord, which would be more confirmation of a fibroma versus, you know, fasciopathy involving not the insertion, but, 
the mid substance tends to be a through and through with with loss of you know the normal fibular echotexture, but it's it's tough. Um, just One other to thing I would add along that line is if you see multiple, um, then you pretty much know it's a fibroma. And if you're trying to decide, you know, you can certainly look at the other side as well, because fibromas often are bilateral and come in multiples. And so, you know, continue to scan out distally. Uh, and if you see, you know, two, three, four thickenings, um, then that's really helpful as opposed to the, the single um, abnormality that you may be questioning, whether it's, you know, a partial tear uh, versus, the, versus the fibroma. Uh, in the young athletic population, uh, you know, in our, our runners and such, we'll, we'll see those changes a couple centimeters distal to the calcaneus. Um, you know, at least I will often more there than I will back at the calcaneus, or at least, you know, as common. Um, and that's, you know, just trying to distinguish between what's a, you know, a partial thickness subacute tear versus a fibroma can be can be challenging. Um, and that's where I think looking for, you know, for evidence of another nodule, you know, is, re is really helpful in those cases. Yeah, good point. You know, Ryan, your, your, um, your protocol is thorough. Um, and it reminds me that I should probably, at least at, at a minimum, have the distal plantar fascia. I mean, I'm sorry, the distal Achilles as part of the protocol, which I don't. Um, I do have just one short axis view um, going across the intrinsic, you know, the foot muscles. So I do get the ADM, the FDP and the quadratus plantae, just one single view. And, and as you mentioned, you know, part of our protocol is at least a long axis view at the insertion of the lateral cord, because, you know, when people have plantar fasciopathy, they tend to walk on their lateral foot because mm -hmm. the insertion is medial. So um, we often will see concurrent, you know, enthesiopathy to lateral cord and as you mentioned in your talk, Ryan, I always put, you know, there is or isn't pain with sonopalpation because they may be asymptomatic. Um, and then make sure I follow that lateral cord to its fruition onto the, so the lateral cord originates on the lateral aspect of the medial tubercle, not the lateral tubercle, the calcaneus. And so I will always follow that back to it because, you know, if that's involved and you're playing a procedure, as you know, um, you got to make sure you get lateral enough to also incorporate that. So yeah, I, I would. Um, the protocol is just very thorough, and it doesn't take that long. Um, but you, you know, got it all in there. Yeah, and to be honest, you know, I <clears throat> in the past, you know, uh, uh, evaluation of the Achilles wasn't always in my protocol for this. Um, you know, in, in some patients, I, I don't um, do it, but I've just I've had a couple times where I've been fooled. And I think for all the world, it's plantar fascia, and then the plantar fascia looks okay, and we look at their Achilles, and they've got this insertional stuff going on. So I've been, you know, kind of more inclined just to double check my work and make sure we're not missing something. Sure. Well, that was again. Uh, these will be posted on the AMSSM YouTube channel uh, to go back um, and take a look at these. Um, and. Uh, so Brian, thank you very much. And uh, again, the next, uh, the next case series will be in a few weeks um, and we look forward to seeing you. Thanks, Doug.